Chilling in Miami for the weekend. What better beach reading could I ask for? Better than food, man. Добро пожаловать в the Better Than Food book reviews. I'm your host, the guy who can't speak Russian. Good to see you. Hope everyone is doing well. So for today, if you're into depressing, cynical Russian novels a la Dostoevsky, this is right up your alley. Welcome, friend. You've come to the right place. I always do, like... I do way too much, like, dark, cynical, depressing shit, don't I? I really gotta, like... I was thinking of like a happy author, like, you know, somebody who's, who's famous for, for happy novels, but I don't know any, I don't think, or any good ones, no, no, not really. You kind of need that sadness and tragedy to make a good novel, but yeah, I, tend to, I tend to go towards the, the really, really extremely cynical, biting, scathing, dark stuff, whatever you want to call it, but it's definitely in the line of the 20th century French stuff, maybe Thomas Bernhard, You're, you guys are going to love it if, you, if you've been watching for a while. When I finally reached the chapter entitled Cocaine, I was sitting in a hotel on Miami Beach, listening to the song Snake Eyes from the, the, the new Twin Peaks, uh, where, where this band called Trouble plays the road bar in the, in the show if you're watching. And uh, this song, which features Alex Hung Tai, also known as The Last Lizard, also known as Dirty Beaches, uh, is on the saxophone just blaring this thing and the culmination of that song and reading this in the hotel in Miami it was a surreal experience you didn't even need drugs it started to really come alive you're like I mean, the atmosphere is very twin peaks it's very dark i'm just sitting there reading this thing and then i start reading it out loud and it's it's great and it's like something like a full like a like an homage to fellini directed by david lynch and it's just it absurd so it worked out perfectly anyways if you've never heard dirty beaches uh, well go watch twin peaks for one go go listen to stuff by alex hung tai he's the shit and uh go listen to badlands by dirty beaches if you haven't had the pleasure i think that's a great album anyways moving on for starters yes this book features the most accurate depiction of being on cocaine that i've ever come across but you know in literature absolutely drugs of the upper type speed you know stuff like that in general amphetamines when he sees the morning light coming through from behind the curtain. That's such a quintessential horror moment for anybody who takes a trip on anything, really. Uh, you know, or, or just drinking. You know, when you realize that it's, it's uh, uh, daylight is coming and your whole false happiness, you know, your manufactured happiness is going to come to a severe and biting bitter end unless, of course, you continue, continue the, the trip, in, which is just going to make the, the end result come down, the hangover, just so much, so much worse. And uh, it's, it's a vicious cycle, you know, which do you choose? Very, very depressing. I'm gonna read you some right now. I spy the dawn through the slit in the curtain. I feel a weighty void beneath my eyes and in my cheekbones. Every th everything around me is grinding to a halt. My nose still greedily flared as a miserable void down into the throat. And each breath I take makes a painful scratch. Either the air is too coarse and, or the inside of my nose has grown terribly sensitive. I try to dispel the ever-growing burden of despair bearing down on me. I try to call back my thoughts and my ecstasies, the ecstasies of my bearded audience. But what comes up from my memory is the night as a whole. And I am so embarrassed, so ashamed, that for the first time in my life I truly feel I have no desire to go on living. So that's where I'm introducing the uh, novel with cocaine by M. Agiev or Agiev, uh, and that's actually at the end, which I'll speak a little bit more about, or close to the end. This whole cast of Russian coke addicts in a dingy dive bar, dragging this kid down into this hell that will eventually, inevitably, consume his life is the most memorable moment in the entire novel. Though, as we've discovered when we've when we read up to that point. Uh, no one is more deserving of getting dragged into that hell than this kid before he's on drugs. So back in Los Angeles, before I moved over here to St. Petersburg, I was going on my walk along the border of Skid Row in downtown on my way to Little Tokyo to go and pick up my mail. And um, a, package, a package arrived from Berlin uh, containing three books with this, uh, this typed up letter. 
These books were from a guy named Tim Pulse. Great fan, great guy, really solid dude. Big fan of the show. I've got a lot of support in Berlin, which I'm thrilled about. I love Berlin. Big shout out to Berlin. I love Germany. I uh, love that city. That's one of my, one of my favorite places. And uh, there, there's nowhere like it. If you've never had the, the pleasure of going, please, at your earliest opportunity, go to Berlin and uh, go inspect Berghain. Mm -hmm. You can thank me later if you get in. So this is the first book from that package that I'm reading. And of course, obviously I have to. I mean, you send me a book with this title, of course I have to dive in. And uh, it's infinitely, it's very fascinating because we, we don't know much about the author, this M. Agiev. Uh, we know very little about him. Uh, this was his only book. It's thought that uh, this is the nom de plume of a guy named uh, Mark Lazarevich Levy. But uh, he, we don't know. We, we really don't know. They thought it was Nabokov for a while and then Nabokov like said like the book was like decadent and disgusting and all of that, and, you know, as Nabokov does, you know, vehemently denied it. He's a hell of a snob, so that's Nabokov. But from what I've read, when this was published in the 30s, I believe, uh, this was one of the books that came onto the scene and immediately everybody hated it. And then decades later, when it's like translated into French and then it's translated into English, everybody loves it. Of course, everybody loves your, your shit when you're dead. Whatever, it is what it is. Except Novikov, I'm sure he always hated it. <laughs> Immediate comparisons, we'll bring up Dostoevsky, you know, Notes from Underground, which I reviewed, you can refer back to that. Great short read, highly, highly, highly recommended. While this doesn't articulate the complexity of suffering quite to that degree, it serves as a very unique early insight into the mind of a man who, before he was a cokehead, was uh, like an absolutely contemptible human being. What makes him bearable, what makes the novel bearable, really, is his ability to precisely articulate his reflections or confessions. It's sort of a confessional novel. It's kind of like The Loser by Thomas Bernhardt or, uh, oh, I mean, it's like, um, it's, it's very light in comparison to My Struggle. It's, it's, uh, my Struggle is, is, you know, this, this is way more in the, uh, it's in the vein of Saline. Louis Ferdinand Céline, definitely. Definitely in the vein of Journey to the End of the Night. But his reflections kind of allow for this thread of empathy to be established. Particularly because he's aware of his selfish cruelty. The novel reads as kind of like a solipsistic journal. When the events occur, he's like 17 or 18 or something like that, but, I, so, but you know, the prose is more like written by someone like 10 or 15 years later. Uh, that's what it seems like. Regarding the drug use, all the cliches are there, which is fascinating because this was uh, you know, taking place in like, it, theoretically in like 19, what is it? it, says, oh, in the Russian Soviet society in the formative period from 1916 to 1919. That's crazy, you know, because all be, because nothing's changed, you know, it's all, all the, all the cliches about drug addicts are there. <laughs> so it's like, this goes way, way, way further back than what I would think would be like maybe the 60s or the 50s, like at the earliest, and you know. But uh, no, this is, this is all, you know, cokeheads are, are, they've been around for a while and all, all over the world and it's, it's pretty much the same shit. <laughs> yes, it could all be fictitious, of course, yes. But in my opinion, you know, it just, it's, it's pretty close. I don't know. You read accounts of people who have been addicted to cocaine, it's, it's pretty spot on. You know, and when I mean that, I mean modern accounts, you know. Literature about excessive drug use is divisive, of course. Uh, I get it. And I understand the lack of appeal for a certain group of readers, definitely. But the interesting thing about this novel, which may redeem it for y'all naysayers, is the compelling structure. Cocaine doesn't make an appearance until the last third, approximately, of the book, you know. Before that, everything is set up. Prior to the drugs being introduced, you have this whole developed character, this egomaniac, depressed teenager named Vadim Maslenikov. Maslenikov, yes. He's perfectly suited for this addiction. It's almost like, like his destiny, and uh, as if like everything is sort of like leading to this. His point of view is akin to Louis Ferdinand Céline, again, a journey to the end of the night, uh, in the middle of the war, which is not referred to very much, but when it is, reveals the, uh, the inner mechanisms of Vadim's psyche. Talks about becoming one with the crowd, 
Oh. But I did not vilify the Germans because I hated them. I vilified them because the harder I pounded away with my abuse and invective, the more deeply I experienced the exceedingly pleasant feeling of oneness with the crowd around me. If at the time someone had shown me a lever and told me that I could blow up all Germany by giving it a flick, that I could cripple the population and annihilate every living German with a flick of the wrist, I would have done so gladly, without a second thought, and then gone off to make my bows. So positive was I that if something of the sort could be achieved, and was achieved, the crowd would burst into a paroxysm of rejoicing. I had to look at the pronunciation on that. I never say that out loud. Paroxysm. Yeah. The novel is structured in this confessional form, where the author reveals his downfall through describing his relationships with his friends, with his mother, and with this one particular love interest and these other women who he's just lusted after and chased and used. And, uh, and eventually his whole uh, uh, love affair, it's probably appropriate to call it that, uh, with cocaine. I think uh, the, the, nov the word in Russian for novel also, ha it can also be translated to romance. Uh, I believe that's right. So, so, the, so it could also, I think this book is also under uh, the title Romance with Cocaine. So it's kind of uh, a double thing, but this is, uh, but it's very interesting. But the book is about relationships and failed relationships, uh, not only with other people, but also with himself. Uh, his failed relationship with himself, because he certainly has failed himself. And also about romances and the failure of those romances. And so, you know, that word romance is a perfect description of his relationship with cocaine. So, but the most devastating parts of the book for me are not the depictions of drug abuse. It's really the, uh, the relationship with his mother and how cruel he is to her. It's... I'm sure you're probably going to agree. It's difficult to read. It's like actually difficult to read. Even though there's not a lot of real violence, it's just the emotional violence is so... Where he like won't even acknowledge her in public when she's trying to give him money because of the way she dresses as being an indication of her poverty and he's so embarrassed by her, he won't even acknowledge. It's just, disg oh, it's just, I mean, it's just like, makes you wonder like when like you were a teen or it makes me wonder when I was a teenager if I was anywhere near like this bad and if I was like any any inkling of a percentage near that kind of you know uh difficulty to raise if I was ever close to being mean to my mother like that then god I'm so sorry I would be like repenting for the rest of my life but uh I did not steal money from my mother for drugs so you know I can pat myself on the back for that but I mean Oh, God, it just... So, if you enjoyed this review, call your mom, tell her you love her, send her a card, even better, and some flowers. Say, I love you, Mom. I love you a lot. Thank you. Oh, man. Mothers are so patient with their sons. I'm telling you. We never went outside together. Since I did not particularly hide the shame I felt, at seeing her dressed so shabbily, though I did try to hide my shame at her ugly old age, she was aware of it, and the few times she met me in the street she would smile a kind, apologetic sort of smile and look beyond or past me, thereby releasing me from the obligation to greet or approach her. Oh, God, it's fucked up, man. The final irony, as you'll see, is his friendship with his wealthy colleague, Stein, or Stein, whatever, uh, which is the same situation with a role reversal, where he's the poor guy, you know, he's the friend that Stein won't uh, introduce to his parents, and uh, we'll see where that goes, you know. Look, if you've got a problem with cocaine, it is not a good idea to have rich friends. Just saying. Even though I was quite a frequent visitor, Stein never took the trouble to introduce me to his parents. True, if Stein had come to see me, I would not have introduced him to my mother, but similar attitudes can hide diametrically opposed motives. Stein did not introduce me to his parents because he was ashamed of me. I did not introduce Stein to my mother because I was ashamed of her. And every time I came home from Stein's, I was tormented by the humiliation of the poor, whose feeling of spiritual superiority is too strong to envy the rich openly, yet too weak to ignore them. It's curious how the most antagonistic of forces attract one another with an all but irresistible power. And this next one is one of the best lines of the book. 
I'm going to share with you. A man is, say, having dinner, when suddenly, somewhere behind his back, a dog begins to vomit. The man may continue his meal and pay no attention. He may stop eating and walk away without looking. He may. But he feels a nagging force, a temptation of sorts, though what sort of temptation could it be, prompting him to turn his head and steal a glance, even though he has no desire whatever to see what the glance will reveal, even though he knows it will send shivers of repulsion up his spine. Such was the nagging force I felt in connection with Stein. So there are some very classic tropes in the book. There's a horrifying situation that turns out to be a dream where he, he, he has this dream where he thinks his mother has killed herself after he steals from her and runs away from home. And then there's another, another uh, uh, classic trick uh, in, in the end, uh, which is, is it's, it's perfect. It's really, really excellent. Um, I won't spoil it for you. But I found them to be very effective, you know, narrative mechanisms. It, it, it got me every time. Uh, painfully effective. I thought the, the ending was very cinematic, just excellent, uh, uh, nice, sharp, uh, brutal ending. It's very simple. It's just him knocking on a door, and you think you know whose door it is. But you don't. There are a few moments in the book where he seems to have the capacity to act, you know, like a human being. When he falls in love with a married woman, Sonia, he sees the world through the eyes of someone in love, and he's changed dramatically. And I think that's, that's a very honest depiction of what happens to all of us. Uh, you know, we can see through these, these, um, these shades of, you know, different glasses, you know, whether they're, they're um, you can view through the lens of, uh, of depression and hopelessness and cynicism, or you can view it through the lens of, you know, infatuation and love or lust or whatever. And you almost want him to win in this instance. Hard as I sought the words, the words I was now called upon to pronounce, the wondrous magic words of love, I could not find them in me. My experience in matters of love seemed to have convinced me that no one could talk eloquently of love unless his love was only a memory, that no one could talk persuasively of love unless his sensuality was aroused, and no one whose heart was actually in the throes of love could say a word. Now that's a beautiful, beautiful paragraph, I think, you know, so, so he does, you know, he is human, and there's, there's moments where you, uh, you recognize the honesty in his words. Well, they're always honest, but you know, there's, there's a lot of times he's being honest to be cruel, and, uh, or there's cruelty in his honesty, you know. But, um, but then at the same time, there's this dark moment of clarity. I don't know if it's a discovery as much as it's sort of a decision, but uh, I guess you could call it a realization. Um, whether realization or decision, I suppose it's kind of debatable, but uh, like it or not, I had that morning stumbled on the amazing yet absolutely incontrovertible fact that as I was in reality, I could never be admired, much less loved by someone I myself loved. Ah. And I think that's a big indication that you're not doing the right thing. Different things reveal themselves to us through different lenses. And while this doesn't necessarily make them all true, it doesn't necessarily make them all false. It's like, what's, it's like what's true enough? What stands the test of time? Because he's so used to using women to having, you know, sex with no emotion, just total physical lust, he can't arouse himself with this woman that he's in love with because he's just see he's not seeking uh, sexual gratification nearly as much as he's just seeking to dissolve himself into this other into this other being and to be loved. You know, he's seeking like a kind of like a tenderness, like this this emotional love uh, more than he is this this um, satiety of lust. So he fakes being sick one night. And she sees right through him, you know, she, but she misunderstands him, you know. He really is being, you know, he really wants to love her emotionally, but uh, she thinks because, you know, he can't get it up that he's, that the whole, the whole thing just isn't there and he was just a liar the entire time, which in a way, he kind of was, but, you know, it's complicated. It's sad. Thus, his only means of salvation in the novel is ruined. Novel with Cocaine is a humiliating and honest account of cynicism and painful reflection on callous behaviors. 
reminding us, often brutally, that life is endlessly tragic and exciting, and you can truly watch yourself losing yourself, whether it's in another person or it's in drugs or in you know violence or the war or whatever, you know. Uh, and you can do it in slow motion. You can watch yourself losing yourself in slow motion. It's really disturbing. Um, maybe that's just something we realize with time and maturity. I don't know. But uh, it, it's, uh, yeah. It's like Requiem for a Dream in the era of the Eastern Front. The protagonist is not sympathetic, but he's articulate enough so you believe in the sincerity of his reflections. But again, when he comes close to acting like a decent human being, something inside him like violently recoils. It's like he knows that it's good, but it feels weak or otherwise. I don't know. Many novels of this confessional type have this air of, look at me, I'm so horrible, but I'm just like you, so feel bad for me. Or alternatively, yes, I'm a monster, but I'm smarter than you, so respect me. But this is more along the lines of, yes, I'm a monster. I've learned, but this is what I've done. The story is not self-pitying, though the author has many chances to you know, successfully orchestrate a manipulative scenario in which the reader may fall into that trap. He's a callous fucking brat, but he is telling it the way it is, or as he sees it, and uh, is doing his best to analyze his behavior. When he gets what he wants, it turns out to be the absolute worst thing for him. All the way up until he assaults his mother, he runs away from home, and he locks himself away in his rich friend's house doing line after line of coke until he's just going, you know, he just goes insane. It's striking to me that you can finish a novel and enjoy it without liking the protagonist. Like, I don't, I don't think the same rules apply to film. Like, I can't, like, if you were watching a film and you're like, oh man, I really fucking hate this guy. You know, I mean, it's like, or, or, or man or woman or whatever, you know, it's like, if you really hate the protagonist of a film, uh, I don't know if the same rules apply, you know, it's sort of like, I'd kind of like, I give it like 15, 20, 25, I give it like 25 minutes, maybe half an hour, it, maybe, maybe we're just more impatient with films, I don't know, but, or maybe I'm more patient with books, which would be amazing because it takes even more time, I don't know, I have no idea. It's interesting to, to, to compare the rules of, you know, uh, uh, novels and film, uh, they're very, very different, and uh, I love them both. Novel with cocaine, better than food, that's definitely how the coke addict feels about it. Always remember life is far too short to do coke or read bullshit, or be mean to your mom. So if you enjoyed this review, go tell your mom you love her, and if you'd like to help support the show, you can head over to patreon.com forward slash books are better than food, private vlog, book club stuff, you can get updates on what I'm reading before I review it, so you can like give me some feedback about what you think about the book, and I can incorporate that if it's cool, and we can have a dialogue, and that's awesome, because you know, so uh, yeah, hit me up on Facebook, give me a like if you would, would really appreciate it. Maps of Meaning is coming in August. Very, very dense. Great, but dense. But saw some people were asking about that. Yeah, Maps of Meaning, that will be coming in August. Don't know when, but uh, as soon as possible, of course. But that's gonna be the most uh, ambitious review that I have done so far, actually that Maps of Meaning will be the most ambitious review I've done so far. Yeah. Good to see you as always. Stay strong, take care of yourselves, and have a good night. Ciao.